Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and I couldn't be more excited to introduce to you today a guest panel of three incredible MK Ultra, SRA, and human trafficking survivors and warriors who are all used and recognized within their networks for having spiritual gifts. On today's episode, we will be honing in on one of these spiritual gifts in particular that has interested many of you and me, and this is the phenomenon of psychic abilities. Joining us today to discuss this topic is Rachel Vaughn, Max Lowen, and Doug McIntyre. The interest to create this panel began when Rachel mentioned something in her episode testimonial on the imagination that sparked a lot of attention within the community, and that was central heterochromia. This topic alone opened up so many eyes and ears and potentially helping to answer a question that many survivors and chosen ones ask, which is, why me? And I believe these three amazing warriors are on the cutting edge of researching how to best answer this question, which not only can help survivors take their own power back, quite literally, but can also serve to help society as a whole in understanding the miraculous capabilities of the human body, mind, and spirit that are all but stripped from modern day education systems. Psychic abilities often get written off as being fake, fiction, a conspiracy, or even new age, thanks in part to the people who exploit this gift and use it for personal gain in society at those sketchy little psychic shops, as well as within mainstream media, which has largely positioned special gifts to only exist in fiction movies and Marvel characters. But what you're going to see today is that the truth is indeed stranger and more amazing than fiction. Humans literally have inherent capabilities that are superhuman in nature and supernatural, and these child abuse systems know this and seek it out in children. The problem is, is that these gifts end up being exploited and used to push evil agendas in these systems instead of teaching these children how to cultivate and use these gifts for the purposes God intended. What I've come to find is that these abilities are more common than anybody knows. And by educating the public, we begin to take the power away from the, en from the enemy by shining a bright light on the darkness. These amazing warriors on the show today will be covering a plethora of subjects, including a deeper dive into central heterochromia, psychic abilities and how they relate to MK Ultra and SRA, scouting processes, how SRA and MK survivors who heal retain some of these incredible abilities, the past survivors take as star seeds, as well as answering some of the questions you and the audience submitted. If you guys want to watch Rachel, Max, or Doug's testimonies, you can go in the show notes. I have done individual testimonial episodes with all of them that I highly recommend you guys watch, and I will have those linked in the show notes for you. Today's episode is going to be jam-packed, and I ask all of you to please put away what you are doing and give these three incredible guests your full attention. I'd also recommend grabbing a pen and paper, as this is going to be an amazing episode chock full of information. Before I finish introducing today's guest panel, I just want to give a very quick reminder that if you're a survivor or whistleblower who wants to share your story on the podcast or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can email me at imaginabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. I'm also on Substack and I'd love your support there where I'm taking up journaling as an outlet for me to reflect on the podcast, guests, and my advocacy work. And you can subscribe to me there at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. All of my own social media links are linked in the show notes, as well as all of these three amazing guests. And I thank you all with my whole heart for all the love, the support, and the safety you provide to this platform and to every single guest. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming our guest panel of honor, 
Voices for the Voiceless, Truth Warriors, Overcomers, Independent Researchers, Brilliant Minds, and Unbroken Spirits, the one, the only, Rachel Vaughn, Max Lowen, and Doug McIntyre. Thank you guys so much for being here with me today. Good to be here. That's quite an introduction. Thank you, Emma. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. You guys are absolutely incredible. And it's always really cool to get a group together. You know, it's so validating. I think one testimony is val validating enough, but when you get three complete strangers who didn't know each other that have similar experiences and other people listening can also ch chime in and validate, um, it's, it's really empowering what that can do for the community. And obviously all three of you have so much insight. You guys are constantly researching. You guys have collaborated on so many projects yourselves. So it's an honor to have you here. What I thought we would do to start, and like I said, for people listening, all three guests have done individual episodes with me, and they've done many other episodes on other podcasts as well. You can go to Rachel's or Max's channel and see all of the above on, on both their channels. So Again, I'll have them go over their links and I'll have those in the show notes for you guys. And I, I encourage you guys to go look into more of the, the podcasts that they do and that they have. Um, and on, on this podcast, they've also done testimonials and I'll have those in the show notes too for a quick reference. And then under the show notes of all their individual episodes are also where you can find them. So I thought since you guys have already been here and done your full testimony, I thought what we could do is go around and you guys could share since the topic today is psychic abilities you guys could maybe share how this was a part of your life as a child, maybe how you were chosen for it and give a little bit of insight on uh, your own personal experiences and how psychic abilities was a part of, of your own upbringing. And why don't we start with Rachel? Okay. Well, thanks again, Emma, for having us on, darling. Um, as we discussed in our previous interview, I was, I believe my father chose my mother because she had central heterochromia and she had psychic ability in her side of the family. And her father had been part of a, um, a military sort of, he had military sort of background. So that's also part of the, the selection process. They look for, it, with the psychic programming, the theta psychic programming under MK Ultra, they look for people who have intergenerational abuse at least three levels or three generations. So if you're the third generation of that, then you're prime. If you've got central heterochromia, you're prime. If there's anybody in the family who has RH negative blood, that's also, you know, part of that, that satanic bloodline that seems to have some sort of influence on psychic ability as well, or those families seem to have a lot of psychic ability in them. Um, so, yeah, I believe my father chose my mother to breed with because my three siblings who I don't have the same mother with also have, um, or two of those have the same central heterochromia. So I think my father chose both his um, wives to produce children with. I do have another sibling that, that I don't have access or contact with him at the moment. So I can't work out whether or not he's got the same thing. Um, and Carl, if you're watching, get in touch. Um, so I was used from very early age, from infancy. Uh, it started with memories of um, being shown Xena cards. Uh, I had to look up what a Xena card was because I wasn't sure what these things were. They were about a foot. Well, I was very small at the time. I was still small enough to have a dummy in my mouth, a, a nappy on and be held up by my father for the testing. But these cards seemed very large, like about a foot tall. They, they seemed quite huge. They were white with black markings on them. And at that time, my I was asked, even though I wasn't verbal enough to speak at the time, I was asked to work out what somebody in another room was seeing on one of these cards and then to point out which card they were seeing. So that was a form of, uh, I guess, um, psychic spying on what was going on in somebody else's mind, or I guess it was a form of psychic driving, but most psychic driving is um, this, this constant music um, refrains that they play over and over with people. I would take that as being, you know, um, projection, perhaps some sort of psychic projection that that person was doing into my mind, or I was just picking up on it. I've also been used, I mean, there's so many things they use me for, but to read auras, um, to to work out um, whether or not a person was a good person or a bad person, someone that could be trusted with in the cult or not trusted, which sounds ridiculous when you're talking about a satanic cult, but they know that there are people within their group that they can't trust. So if they're, if they're completely and utterly psychopathic, then they can't trust them to do certain things or to be in any kind of allegiance with them. So... Um, most of the people that they want to use in the cults are the ones that are good people that have been co-opted into doing bad things. 
uh, and under some sort of control and um, blackmail, I suppose. Um, I was also used as a remote viewer. So there was lots of different things that they used me for. I used to have prophetic dreams. I used to be able to see the future. I still see the future as well, but I don't have to wait for it to come up in a dream. So, I mean, there's, there's so many different things that could go on forever and I don't want to take up everybody's time, but that, that's just, yeah, some of the stuff that I was used for. Thank you so much for answering that. And then let's go to Doug next. <clears throat> yeah, I'm still recovering a lot of my memories. So I don't have a lot of memories at this stage of them experimenting on me when uh, through the MK Ultra or the cult things. Um, but I definitely have the ability. So by the age of five, you know, I was fully dissociative. I could go out of body. I can turn pain off so I don't feel pain. Um, yeah, I can go to the psychic realm, do all sorts of things. So for me, it was a self-protection mechanism, which is what is natural to humans. So when we go through extreme trauma <laughs> and our body's no longer safe, we have to go out of the body to feel safe. So as little kids going through extreme trauma, if you can't be safe in your body because you're being abused or traumatized or all the things they do to us, then we go out of body. So originally I would go into psychic realms as a little kid, which they did use, but I don't have a lot of recollection of it, but I was very good at communicating with spirits. They would come through the walls and I would talk to them and things like that. Um, like Rachel, I had precognition. I could see the future. I could know things that were going to happen hours, days, weeks, sometimes months before they happened. So I had a very um, strong connection psychically. Then they put me on LSD as a little kid, and then that made that too scary to go out of body anymore because all of a sudden I'm hurtling through galaxies and not knowing what's going on. So then I had to go into my imagination to try and find somewhere safe. So it's this journey of the soul to um, to survive because we have such strong survival instincts. You know, how do we survive when our body's not safe? You know, how do we survive when uh, the spiritual realms aren't safe and things like that? So it's it's this, you know, survival mechanism to get through whatever we go through. And the fact that we have these mechanisms has helped us to survive. Sometimes I wonder whether that was a good thing because you know, just sort of getting up and keep going and keep going and keep going is very torturous at times. Um, um, but, yeah, it's an amazing life, an amazing childhood. It's not necessarily the easy one, but, yeah, we experience things that are quite profound. Um, and, you know, I find it easy to connect to spirits, nature spirits, to God, to source, to all those sorts of things. That's more the world that I live in rather than the physical world. And I have to do things to remind myself I have a body because so often I turn it off and so often I'll cut myself and I won't realise it and I'll wonder where all the red texture is and then I realise I've got blood on me and so on and so on. Yeah, so that happens quite a bit. Um, recently, I almost cut my finger off. You can see it's, you know, things just heal up almost without scars. So I've got scars all over me, but they heal up so you can't see them. So we have different things that happen to our bodies. Um, but psychically, yeah, the psychic realms for me are very easy because that's my natural state of being. Uh, the issue for me is being in the body. Yeah, so I hope that sort of helps. Yeah, do you have, I can't tell with your glasses, do you have central heterochromia as well, Doug? Yeah, I do. I have in the middle, it's um, like a hazel colour. And on the outside, it's green. Sometimes it goes bluish. But I didn't realise a lot of times because my mother's uh, poisoned me all my life. Uh, she's got access to my house and the poisoning caused my eyes to go a darker colour. So when I realised what was happening and I stopped the poisoning, then all of a sudden my eyes started going into the two colours. And that's how I started um, researching the heterochromia because I would look in the mirror and go, well, my eyes aren't brown anymore. They're you know, the hazel with green or blue, and sometimes it'd be a blue ring, then green, and the hazel would say, yeah. So that was what triggered me on the heterochromia journey, was thinking, you know, my eyes are a different colour, my father's eyes are green, uh, two brothers, their eyes are blue, and I've got a sister whose eyes are brown. So, yeah, we have every colour in my family. Wow. Thank you so much for answering that. And Max? So I'll... 
I'll start where Rachel started. Um, my mother's uh, family line, um, they're all RH negative blood. Um, I know there's at least two generations that go back. I'm not sure about further than that. Um, when I was a child, I was um, definitely psychic, uh, telepathic. Um, I could, like Doug just said, I could be injured and heal my body very, very quickly. Um, I think one of the things I was trained in is to have an audiographic and photographic memory. And I've retained that today um, because of the things that I went through as I, when I, even when I got out and I was in my twenties and thirties, I, I was always so scared when I was interacting with other people, even though I'm very social and charismatic, there was a part of me that was super scared. So I would sort of dissociate. So this memory thing came in handy because I would record the conversation. And then later when I was more calm, I could replay it in my head. So that's actually helped me a lot in life. Um, sometimes I've annoyed people because kind of in a lawyeristic way, I'm like, no, you said da 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 da, you know. And so um, there was that ability. Um, I was telepathic with animals and trees as a small child. And um, so I was studied a lot in my uncle's facility for these different um, abilities. And the psychic ability, the way I would describe it, it's like when I see people, they're like a billboard. So it's like they have flashing colors or life experiences or their soul where, you know, the, the kind of soul they have. So there's a lot in a person um, that I actually believe we're all psychic as humans. It's a natural ability that we have, but it's been dumbed down in this reality here. It's been severed. But I think eventually, as we go more towards the light, that all of us will probably regain it. And I would even say a lot of us, a lot of people are psychic, but they don't know it. They don't realize what that means. It's very subtle. Sometimes you just know a thing about a person. You just feel something. So I am I feel things primarily. So I just sort of pick things up. Um, there was once a... a a mom when my daughter was small, a, another mom, and she was talking to me. And I kept staring right here between her eyes. And I felt like there was something there. And then I found out a few days later that she had a tumor there and she was, you know, having surgery. It's not like I was trying to, but so again, I, I do think all of us, there's maybe a continuum and we have this ability. Um, but that's how it manifests for me, just kind of knowing things and picking up things. And, you know, with among the different tortures, when I was a child, there was a time I remember I was about four, I think, and I was put in this box, it was like a metal box, and it had no, no seams, no cracks. So you, it, it's kind of designed to make you go crazy, because you can't tell if it's night, day, you know, up, down, whatever. And I don't know how long I was in there, but I have a sense it was a long time. And what would what I would do in those situations is I I would be somewhere else, kind of like what Doug was saying. I would I was actually in this beautiful nature spot with a waterfall, and I was swimming in there with the dolphins and an elephant there and a lion. And so I had this thing where dur during different tortures, I would go somewhere else and be there. And then the last thing I'll say is I was killed uh, various times. But when I would die, I would leave my body. I would always be there with Jesus. That was my, my friend who was always with me. And I would see, he would show me a holographic reality. And there's different timelines and different possibilities of the same thing. And, and it, it really makes a difference whether one of us is there or not. So I would see, I, he would always say, you can choose to go back or not because it was such a difficult life you know I always had that choice and based on what I would say I would always choose to come back so I had this ability to die in whatever form and then come back into my body so of course they studied that too um so that's kind of a little sum of some of the abilities that I uh, came in with
Thank you for sharing. It's so insightful. And like I said, really validating to hear three people that have totally different families, totally different places where they grew up, you know, and there's so many similarities in what you guys have been through. Um, I want to expand on this question and sort of go into why is this important to these systems that they find people that have these gifts? You know, you guys mentioned a few ways that they tested you or things that they were looking for in somebody that had this, maybe some some telltale signs. But on a grand scale, what are some of the ways that these systems are taking these gifts and and using them to their advantage for say agendas and, and what agendas and why why is it important that they have this ability uh and to begin with and let's start doug you want to start this one yeah well it, my understanding from my past is it's all about mind control and mind controlling the masses so part of what i was involved in as a little kid was mk ultra came to sydney australia in 1960 and it went to Sydney University and uh, it was attached to the hospital I was born at at that stage. And I vividly remember them doing experiments on me to do with colour TV because we only had black and white TV at that stage. And one of the guys who was one of the leading experts in the world on hypnosis um, went to Sydney Uni and he was involved in that. And it was a constant experimentation you know, like, you know, to develop the Manchurian candidate, someone who at the front is very calm and collected, but has a killer side at the back and can be used as a pawn to do their evil because they're cowards of people in the cults, total utter cowards. So rather than putting themselves in danger, they would rather use little kids or other people, program people to do their dirty work. So then, you know, they don't have to worry about any consequence. So, you know, they live their lives full of fear and cowardice, I think. Um, and so for years I would have these, it was like a checkerboard of different colours that would change colour in front of me. Every night I'd go to bed and that would be left in my head from the programming of the days. And that went on for years and years and years. And from what I understood now, going back, getting some of the papers and things like that, the whole basis of everything is mind control. And what they're trying to do with modern media, I think I read somewhere the other day that the average person uh, via the modern media has seen 16,000 deaths. So, yeah, it's, it's that many. So what they're trying to do is to traumatise us because our body, when it's watching a movie, doesn't know what's real or what's not. You know, and I find it's very helpful to tell myself what I'm watching is not real because what they're trying to do is trigger people to see, you know, when they see death or rape or violence or things like that, to get them to do the re recall or the freeze, and then they can start implanting things as well. So for me, it's just about controlling the masses. Um, and also, as was mentioned before, they want to dumb the masses down to make the average population as stupid as possible feed them all the lies while they keep the truth so again it's just a control thing and a fear thing but you know um that that's how i understand it all it's always been about control and then being in control great answer doug max you have anything you want to add to that yeah um you know your question was why why do they do this so we have to keep in mind that this is done to the children of these elite bloodline families. You know, it's us, but it's also, you know, anyone you see on the world stage has been put through these things so that the, the child is broken down and then, you know, the different altars that uh, happen from the excess trauma are programmed so that these people are groomed and prepared to take the highest positions of power in the world so somebody has to run the global cult. So they prepare that generation from childhood by, a, by perpetrating this torture and this abuse and splitting them off and then programming them to do whatever it is they're groomed to do or become, right? So my family was in politics, you know, generals and ambassadors and all that kind of stuff. So I suspect I was being prepared for some role on the stage myself. Um, but that's what they do. You know, I remember um, um, my friend Kathy O'Brien, she 
told a story about one of these hunting parties that we've all experienced where they, you know, they bring the kids in and then you run and hide and then the perpetrators come and find you and rape you and all that. But she described that uh, George Bush Jr. was one of the kids at that party, at that hunting party where she was. And he was being hunted too, right? He was, so this is what I'm saying. They do this to prepare their global leaders so they have full control of them, right? So, you know, and you can break down a child and make them anything. You can make them an assassin. You can make them, you know, a lot of us have been used as honeypots to seduce. Uh, you can do, you know, you could have used, you can use my audiographic photographic memory for spying. You know, when I was a kid, I, I was, I, when people said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say a spy. I think I was actually, you know, maybe being prepared for that. Um, you can groom kids to um, really do anything. That's, if you think about it, I, I've used this example, like even, in China and Russia, you know, when they would select kids very young and, and train them to be Olympic athletes, you know, it's not much more of a step beyond that. The human being can, has incredible potential. We're not living up to our potential in this reality on purpose. They're not allowing it, but they know this. And if they take you and they train you and they, you know, and they put you through all this stuff, you become... So you become superhuman. So I always say like my training gave me a black belt. I have an endurance that's not natural, a self-healing ability, whatever all the gifts that I have, they were born through torture, but you can be developed into anything. They know this and they do this. And so I would say, why do they do it? To create the future global cult leaders and fully control them. Now, with some of us, that didn't work. We broke out of that. But with many, it has worked. Great answer. Thank you so much for that insight, Max. And Rachel? Yeah, well, just, just to add on to what Max and Dagger already said, which is just brilliant. Um, they also use psychics, children and adults to spy on one another. So if you look at the Freemasons oath, they have these oaths that if you do this or you do that, or you speak out of turn, you talk till about the truth of their, their secrets in public, they can then be executed in all manner of ways. And they go into great detail about how they're going to do it to try and terrify their, one another into not speaking about these things. So they would use me as a child to spy on whether or not they were speaking out of turn. They do that They do that a lot. So that's that remote viewing. It's part of remote viewing um, is, is to spy on whether or not these people are doing what they're supposed to do. So that's another factor. It's control. So it's control of the masses and it's control in, in many different ways. There's also the fact that, you know, they don't drink the fluoridated water. They they don't dumb themselves down. So we've got fluoride in the water for a reason. Many people don't realise this. I'm sure people on your channel would be aware of it. But fluoride calcifies the pineal gland. Now, the pineal gland is the seat of where our antenna, which is our, our soul is our antenna, and we get to a certain frequency and we can pick up information from the Akashic Record which is past, present, future, all events, actions, thoughts, everything that's happened will happen and has happened um, or is happening. Um, so when you calcify the pineal gland, that information cannot come through into the mind and, and be perceived. So that's why we get fluoridated water. That's why we have so many pesticides in food. It's not just to make us sick. It's also to make us stupid. And of course, these elites don't do that. And the the, the minions, the, the the people that they want to control don't do that either. I grew up drinking, you know, sure, we drank tap water, but we had always had a rainwater tank because my mother wouldn't touch tap water. She couldn't stand the taste of it. So, you know, in the 70s and 80s, that was reasonably unusual in Adelaide. Um, Adelaide's always been known for the terrible quality of the water. It is so disgusting. Uh, people, you know, come from other countries and drink our water and they say, oh, my God, this is vile. It is really bad. Um, so it tastes of metals. It tastes of chlorine. It, it you know, it's pretty foul. Um, so you know that it's it's control and it's spying. It's spying on many different levels. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Does anybody have anything else that you want to add after listening? I just want to comment on what Rachel said. So the pineal gland. It's also called the the third eye or the inner eye. And I, I did my master's in uh, neuropsychology. 
That pineal gland, even though it's buried deep inside the brain, it has photoreceptive cells and rods and cones, just like our actual eyes. So, I, I mean, I think that's just sort of to confirm what Rachel said. Yeah, it, it actually has crystals in it, little quartz crystals. So if you look at any, any computer, any phone has a quartz crystal in there. So it helps to pick up information. So we are like supercomputers that pick up information from the ether, from from frequencies, electromagnetic frequencies that, you know, are probably well outside of, you know, what the computer and a, and a phone can pick up on. Mm. Wow. I mean, it's it's really sad how repressed this education is from us. I think people would marvel and love themselves so much if they just knew who they were. We're told that we're just these, you know, little ants that need to work 40 hours a week for somebody. And, you know, they, they make everything so expensive and, you know, the mind control, obviously always putting us in fear. It's so sad, you know, all these people that are so depressed and it's like, gosh, if you just realized what you actually are in your body, and that's why I love these conversations because it brings us back to that. It brings us back to who we are and remembering that and re-educating ourselves and reminding us that we're freaking amazing, you know, no matter where we are on the scale. And I wanted to ask, you guys don't all have to answer this. If one of you has an answer or maybe all of you, uh, when Max was talking earlier and even all of you, it reminded me of a word that a lot of people use, I think for a very maybe mild version of psychic abilities, which is intuition. And I wanted to see what you guys, what's the difference between intuition or psychic abilities, or is it sort of, a, is it sort of a psychic ability just on maybe a, a very small scale internalized where somebody might realize something about themselves or, you know, have a hunch about something. I wanted to get feedback if anybody had, an answer to that i would say intuition is that gut feeling something you feel intently or intensely but you don't know where it's coming from whereas there's many many different psychic abilities there's clear audience where you can actually hear voices of um, otherworldly entities clear sentience where you can see you know you pick up on, on on things around you that other people don't pick up on which is probably what an empath empath would pick up on precognition where you see the future so there's many many different areas of um, psychic ability yeah. I would say intuition is that I connect it to the heart and I think it's the voice of our soul see the mind can be hacked and it is in this reality and there is there are patents out there so I'm not making this up very many of them where they can manipulate our thoughts, they can insert thoughts, they can go into our dreams. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. So you can't even trust. And, you know, if all of us in this human form, in this reality, I'm, I'm sure I speak for everyone, there, there's a constant stream of thoughts, you know, some negative, some not. And sometimes, you know, if you really think about it, <laughs> the thoughts kind of run us instead of us controlling or deciding what we think. So you can't trust, the mind is very useful, but you can't, but it's connected to this dimension and manipulated. So intuition is that guiding voice from your soul. And the, the mind is great, but it should be in service to the heart. And by the way, the gut has a different brain in it. It also has a brain, it's all connected with the vagus nerve. So I think intuition is again, a natural thing that we all have. It's, it's drowned out by all the noise. But if you cultivate it, that's what can guide you in your life. And, you know, so many people have said, I'm walking down a dark, I'm, I'm going to go down this one street or alley and this voice in me says, don't. Well, that's your intuition. That's that part of you protecting you. There's a million examples of that. And when everyone says when they don't listen to that voice and they go ahead and do what they thought, something something happens, right? And then they wish they had listened. So. I think it's a natural, it's like that voice of our soul speaking to us all the time. And I think that should be the thing that we value the most. But of course, we're taught in society that that's silly to devalue it precisely because it's so important. Great answer. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Doug? Yeah, I was going to say intuition is like a knowingness. So it's for me when I get intuition as opposed to other things happening, it's like, as Max said, it's like, a, a compulsion to do something, you know, that may be out of the normal. It's like, oh, yeah, don't drive down here or don't walk here or go and talk to this person or things like that. But there can be lots of different levels. So 
how I understand it is I have a higher self. I don't bring all my soul into this incarnation. Um, I just bring, you know, 60 to 80% or something like that. And the rest of my soul is still up in the soul space. So I can learn to communicate with the rest of my soul, my higher self. I can learn to communicate with my God. I can learn to communicate with my guides as well. Um, I can learn to communicate with different spiritual forces here, with telekinesis, with other people, all sorts of different things. So as you become more used to it, you, you start to see different energy lines with different levels of communication. So the intuition for me can be self, but it can also be someone in my network, you know, my energetic network, if I can put it that way, who knows something's coming and they're trying to warn me to get out of the way or it may not be part of my life contract. I might be heading down a certain direction and it's not in alignment with what I've contracted to, he to come here to do and it may stuff up what I'm meant to do. So I'm sort of reminded and I, I think all of us um, have had this where sometimes we ignore it but it gets stronger and stronger and stronger till it knocks us across the head sometime to make sure we get back on path or we avoid something that's you know not good for us or might circumvent something that we're meant to do here but it, it's something that's fun to explore with and uh, you know a lot of people I think journaling you can write down what your intuition is for the day and then see how the day unfolds and it's a way that you can learn my guides have always kept me on a very short leash so from the moment I'd wake up in the morning it'd be like do this do this do this do this and it was like that all my life um, and sometimes I'd get crazy with them because I'd say, just let me live my life, you know. But I had to learn to develop that intuition. That was part of what I was learning. So it's, um, yeah, it's something very worthwhile, I, I think, for people to listen to. Thank you so much. Those are awesome answers. And I want to I want to touch on with all of you, uh, Rachel had mentioned there's different types of psychic abilities. And then also I'm hearing from all of you that there's different ways maybe to experience these two, whether it's getting a visual or having a feeling. And I wanted you all to go around and maybe uh, if you could educate us on uh, what types of psychic abilities you guys have, um, what those are, and then how do you experience that? Is that a visual that you get? Is it a feeling? How does that uh, manifest in your field, in a sense, for you guys to be able to do this. And let's start with Rachel. Okay, so I'm just, you know, going through in my head. Um, so there's precognition where you can, I can see the future, and I do that a lot with clients. A lot of people want to know what's coming so that they can be prepared or, you know, to, to allay any fears. Uh, there's telekinesis, so I can often pick up what people are thinking. For example, um, you know, this is a, a form of it. I'll know when the phone rings who's on the other end of the line, often, not all the time, but often. Uh, I can also, um, I think I have some sort of influence too because if I want someone to contact me, I can make that happen, usually within a day, sometimes within a few hours, but usually within a day. Uh, there's also um, remote viewing, so I can see things from a distance. I've uh, recently been experimenting with moving things with the mind as well. So I can turn a flywheel. I do an experiment um, or I, I show a video of um, me doing an experiment with, tele with telekinesis, which is very simple. You can see anybody on YouTube doing this. If you look up telekinesis experiment on YouTube, you'll see people doing it. It's just turning a small uh, disc of paper or alfoil on a pin. And you can actually see where the aura interacts. If you can read auras and see auric energy, you can see where the aura interacts with the, with the disc. So there's that as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think you know, I'm sure there's many other things that I can't think of. Aura reading, obviously. Um, there's things that I was taught to do as a child that were not very nice um, because that was sort of what, because it basically when you're doing the psychic theatre training, it's assassin training. So I don't want to go too much into that, but there's that as well. So, you know, we are incredibly powerful uh, and there are so there are quite a few. I mean, look at um, Alistair Crowley. I was only talking about this recently in an interview. He was known for, you know, uh, one particular incident uh, is talked about where he was walking behind a gentleman with, with a friend of his and tripped the person up that was in front of them with his mind. So you can interfere with people energetically with your aura. And that's something that, you know, a lot of people have a great deal of fear around. If you look into, you know, religions, they say you shouldn't look into these things. And, you know, people who do that sort of thing, obviously not, not, kind-hearted because you don't go around doing that sort of thing if you have those abilities 
but people do have these abilities and this is something that people need to know because I think a lot of us go around or not me personally but a lot of people go around thinking that they are not supposed to develop these abilities because number one they'll get an attachment of some sort they'll get they'll invite something dark in or they'll get turned dark because they'll get too much power there's lots of you know fears around these things but the problem with that is if we all shy away from it the satanists the dark people will be playing with these things and have all these abilities and none of us will all the light workers will just be cowering in the corner saying well we can't look into that because it's too scary too dangerous we've got to be warriors on both sides there's going to be dark people who are going to manipulate these things humans have incredible abilities we all have to be armed and protected max um, I'd say for me, it mostly manifests as just a knowing all of a sudden I just know something and I've learned to trust that it's different than when you think something it's just boom, it's there and you know it. Um, I have seen moments in the future and, and I would, I've called them visions. So that's a visual. It's a flash of something. It's a scene. Um, for example, I, uh, maybe six months or so before I got pregnant with my daughter, I had a vision of myself standing on a mountaintop, holding a baby and, and full of joy. And, you know, a few months later I was pregnant. I was not trying to, it was, it was with birth control at age 38. So, you know, the odds are not really high there, but the vision told me that was coming. I didn't. I wasn't on that wavelength. So I decided to interpret the vision as a psychologist that I am. I was like, oh, it's probably me holding my inner child. Well, no, it was actually, and that's how my visions are. They're, they're very literal. So, um, so with precognition, I get visions and I get, um, I can, when people are talking to me, like I said, they're a billboard even, even now. So a person can be using words, but I'm picking up and and I pick it up in a in, in I'm, I'm a cancer sun and a cancer moon. I pick it up in my body. I feel it, so I can feel them what they really mean. So often, you know, so it's very difficult to lie to me because words are can be deceptive. But I just feel the energy. It's just it's so clear, you know. And again, I think we can all do this once you kind of clean out some of the stuff that's in the way. We we have this net natural ability think of animals think of dogs they know when someone's a good person they know when someone isn't right so i mean duh we have that ability it's just you know again it's been something that like rachel said it's been linked to the dark or you know bad stuff but you know that's a trick we we all have that um absolutely so that would be a few of the uh of the ways that i would say um that i'm psychic I, I also actively manifest. So if I have an idea of what I want, um, I visualize it, I feel it. I feel the emotion of it, like the joy of the thing I'm trying to manifest. I put myself there. So you might say it's in the future, but we can, it's, we can manifest, it's like we create, I create that version of me that I want, where I want with what I want surrounding it. And then I, I and then I revisit that and I'm actually in that place. And then I think it sort of draws the, the present me and that me together and then boom. So I've had experience doing that and then literally manifesting what I have worked on. Yeah. Which again, I think we can all do. That is so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing, Max. Doug, do you have anything to add on your end? Yeah, I was going to talk about thoughts. I have an interesting relationship with thoughts, and I've done a lot of psychedelics, and that's really helped me in relation to thoughts. And so I don't identify my thoughts as part of me. And so what I um, went through when I did my first Ayahuasca session was I would watch two entities downloading all the thoughts into my head. And so they were teaching me that the thoughts don't come from me, but what their role to do was to download all the thoughts into me and how I responded to those thoughts showed where I was on my life path, on, on my contractual path. 
And so once I realised that the thoughts weren't me, I could understand that some of the things I was getting upset about, I didn't need to because they were just there and I didn't identify with them. And so I've learned to just let thoughts flow through me like a waterfall. Um, and sorry about that. Um, and that, that's been a really, really good process. And what I've done with the different entities, because I can see the entities, but I can't describe to you what they look like because they're in another dimension that's higher than these dimensions. So I can sit there now and look at them and just see them doing their work, um, but I can't see what they look like because it's just, I don't have the ability to describe it because it's the, it just doesn't fit in our concepts of sight and things like that. But what I've learned to do with the entities is um, work on the thoughts and things like that. And now I understand the whole process of thoughts and that they flow through us. And that's what inspiration is. I think a lot of people from Einstein to Da Vinci to all different people throughout history talk about, you know, thoughts coming into their heads and being inspired. They say normally when an invention comes to the past, at least three people around the world had the same thought at the same time. So I look at thoughts as a way that the universe directs humanity in the direction that it wants it to go. And, you know, the fact that we're, you know, speedy up in terms of our evolution with technology and things like that, to me, is something that's just a conscious uh, driven thing that, um, you know, God is directing. Um, and meanwhile, we've got, you know, other people trying to step in and direct it themselves. But it's, you know, I, I think as we, you know, realise our thoughts on ourselves, and I, I had a thing on a boga where I did a flood there, and all the thoughts in my head were purged out of my head. So after eight hours, I had no thoughts left and nothing to think. So there are all these, you know, different experiences you can where you can start to test things with yourself um, and understand and start to observe your thoughts rather than just engaging with them. And I found that really, really helpful. I sit there and go, okay, this thought's coming into my head. Okay, do I feel like that thought's part of me? How do I react to it? How do I respond to it? And it starts to teach me not just about me, but also about what's coming through. So there's, there's, there's lots of ways that we can, I think once we step outside of ourselves, and look, as survivors, it's easier for us because we're dissociative. So I can do the co-consciousness thing where I can be feeling the thought, but watching myself feeling the thought at the same time and also taking notes. So it's that level of, I think, understanding ourselves as we move through life gives us a lot more information. Yeah. Oh, do either of you ladies have anything else to add after listening? Can I just add to what Max was saying too about visions? So everything that I get when I do get do remote viewing and, and all of the work that I do is visual. I'll get these visions. I don't work with clear audience. I was used as a child in rituals to communicate with demonic entities because the cowardly adults around me didn't want to have to do it. Hearing that, I switched that off. Um I have a concern for people who do hear voices simply because my, my experiences with that was very negative, but I also know that with schizophrenia, and Max might be able to speak about this as well, there's a gentleman called um, Jerry Marzinski who's done a lot of studies on this, that schizophrenics are actually hearing demonic entities that are trying to drive them to kill themselves or kill other people or harm themselves or harm others. These are these are voices that are discarnate that these poor people are hearing. And they just, they just get medicated to the point of being a zombie so they can't hear the voices anymore. What they need is some sort of exorcism or, or assistance to clear that out of their aura so that these things can't attack them anymore. So I just wanted to give a, a sort of a, a warning on, on listening to voices um, or just being very careful if you ever hear a voice and it's telling you to do terrible things, it's not your guides, it's something else. Yeah, yeah I worked with uh, schizophrenics uh, early on right out of university at a psychiatric hospital and it's exactly what Rachel said. I mean, the voices were tormenting to the, the people, whether they were men or women, and they would tell them to do certain harm to somebody else or to themselves, you know, and it, that was the really the main feature, like a constant torment, right? So, um, and they would say, I remember this young woman i'm she she was probably in her 20s and she was very tiny and petite and she kept telling me about that she was a murder a murderess in in some you know she had a, a, all this information about a specific location 
and all these bodies and everything, but clearly it wasn't her, right? So it was some other entity speaking through her. And in psychology, it's considered a chemical imbalance. And so they medicate. Now I've seen these people heavily medicated and the medication doesn't make them better. All it does is it zombifies them to the point that they just, they're literally walking zombies. It's really horrific to watch and they're locked up and, you know, I think we have to find a whole new thing to uh, help people with schizophrenia. And it isn't the meds and it isn't locking them up. It's dealing with, we're going to have to have a mind shift, a mindset shift here that this is demonic possession. And I say this a lot. I think the world is going to have to accept that De demonic entities exist. The biggest lie that we've been told is that Satan doesn't exist, okay? This is real. I've seen demonic entities. You know, I've seen children sacrifice. I've seen these entities come in. And the elites that run the world, by the way, why are they such psychopaths? Why are they all pedophiles? Why are they so brutal that they can rape a newborn baby or eat uh, the flesh of humans or what all the horrible things that they do we can't people say I can't believe that well that's because we're human and we have a soul what I'm telling you is these they look like a human body but who's inhabiting that body is a demonic entity and that demonic entity was in a ritual invited to come into that person and inhabit them and my uncle who ran the torture facility I'm sure that he had a demonic entity running him because, I mean, the cruelty and barbarism of these people isn't human and it's because they're not human. So I think this is going to be very difficult for the world to sort of accept because we've been raised to think this is all, you know, and they make Hollywood movies and they make it sort of in a way that you think, oh, that's not, you know, it's absolutely real. And I think I can speak for Rachel and Doug, for us having experienced and seen these demonic entities in rituals. I mean, this is unfortunately the reality. Yeah, my father would switch. You could see it on his face. I've got a photograph of him when he was switching into that Evil Max altar where this other thing would take over. Yeah. So you could see it on his face. Oh my gosh, it's so horrifying. And yes, I totally agree. You know, we're especially, you know, all of us that didn't go through what, what you guys did and weren't exposed to that, we're taught academically that our world is just physical, that if you can't touch it and see it, that it there's nothing, there's nothing there to look at. You know, even energy, you know, we know energy exists and that's not even really studied a lot in, you know, different uh, segments of society, even science, you know, sort of diverts from that topic and talks about other things. So this is really important, you know, and, and again, having all of your validation and, and talking about these things, it makes it more normalized and it, it brings people back to, again, like, what is this world that we live in? It is a spiritual metaphysical, you know, world. We are metaphysical, super uh, human in a sense beings, you know, and we're, we're not taught these things. So this is really enlightening. And, and yeah, Jerry, uh, Marzinski, it is fascinating that whole topic and how he brings up that point. You would think if somebody was hearing voices that weren't from a demon, that some of these voices might be happy. Like, why is every right. single voice that people hear literally telling them to kill themselves or hurt other people or do bad things? You would think that there would be a, a different, that everybody would have a different type of voice. Maybe some are angry, some are super happy, some are joyful, you know, so it does, it, it we should ponder things more than what we're just told. And one thing that I wanted to bring up uh, that Max had talked about a little bit in an email is the healing aspect and like how resilient survivors are and how some of these gifts or all of them can be retained through healing. I would love for all of you to go around and I'll start with Max on this one. And maybe I, I've heard some survivors that have talked to me privately that say that they're scared to heal not because they don't want to, but because some of these gifts that, that you grew up with can benefit you as an adult. And some people fear losing that if they try to go on a healing journey, you know, and uh, I would love for you guys to maybe talk on that about the difference between maybe how these abilities were as a child or growing up and then how healing 
impacted positively or negatively your experience with having these gifts? And Max, we'll start with you on this one. I would say you won't lose the gifts. You'll actually gain control of them, um, you know, instead of the dark controlling them. Um, and I always say healing is a revolutionary act because, as Doug said earlier, they use trauma to fragment us into different pieces, and then we're all mind controlled, right? And and poisoned, as Rachel said, it's it's fluoride, it's pesticides, it's vaccines, it's pharmaceuticals, it's chemtrails, it's everything, right? So the point is we are naturally, organically, extremely powerful, light-filled beings full of potential. And so a lot of effort has gone out from these this global cult to, to render us and our consciousness very, very small. So healing is a revolutionary act because if you do heal yourself, you, you're flipping them the bird. Because as you heal yourself, as you get rid of all the mental distorted thoughts that you have, the low self-confidence, you know, the beliefs that are wrong, it, you can, you, you need to heal your vessel. You need to heal your body, you know, by good nutrition, by detoxing the body, because there's so much out there that we need to detox regularly. Um, taking supplements because the soil is doesn't have the nutrients that we need anymore deliberately. Um, exercising, sleeping enough, basic stuff. So consciousness is residing in this vessel. And if this vessel is polluted, the consciousness is not going to be where it could, right? Then I think we need to monitor our thinking because again, there can be a lot of thoughts inserted. And if we're traumatized like we were, you know, I certainly know I had a lot of negative thoughts that were self-defeating and keeping me down. And whenever I would speak out, it, it's programmed. You know, I would have thoughts that would then torment me later. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. You're so stupid, you know. Or, you know, if I told about my abuse, it was thoughts of killing myself, et cetera. So I think it's like uh, we should have mental hygiene, like we shower and brush our teeth. We should constantly watch what we're thinking, not just because they're inserting thoughts in our head, but because of all the, everyone's gone through some degree of trauma. So we need to make sure that we monitor our thoughts. And then if they're negative or disempowering, you can go stop and you can say, cancel, cancel, cancel. And then you can replace that with an empowering thought. And, you know, sometimes people call that affirmations. Um, I believe in gratitude. Every morning I wake up and I'm grateful for everything that I have, you know, food, shelter, the sun's out today, my dog is so cute, you know, whatever it is, I have loving friends, you know, Rachel and Doug are my some of my best friends, you know, I'm grateful every day that raises our frequency and it reminds us, it puts the mental thing into, into a positive gear, right? And if you're if you do gratefuls right when you wake up, you prime your brain brain to recognize good things throughout the day, right? And then that's how you shift your reality. So you got to take care of the body and then the mind. And then we have emotions because this facilitates us keeping ourselves going and balanced. So I always, if I have an emotion, like if I'm really, really, I don't know. Uh, angry, then I allow, I don't throw that on another human. I've learned not to do that, but I allow that anger to come out. So if you have emotions, sometimes you're just in a, in a bad state, then I say, go further into that, express it, cry, scream. Um, I kickbox, you know, that helps me release stuff and get your, let your emotions flow like running water. And then you can reset yourself, right? So we can heal ourselves. And, you know, I did therapy and that was helpful for me in terms of healing a lot because I had had no attachment, you know, in SRA, they break that right from birth. And so that relationship with a therapist was really instrumental for building myself back up. But healing can take so many forms, you know, it can be um, going out into nature, it can be watching your thoughts. It can be all the things I just mentioned. But bottom line, if we constantly work on ourselves, and it's a lifelong journey, 
but just just have that intent in our heads like i want to heal because who we are is who we are it's like we've been covered with all this muck and stuff and the healing is just peeling off these the trauma and these false layers and then boom the shining version of us that we really are is there underneath all that and if we do that like i said that's what the global cult does not want us to do because when we step into our power Here's a news flash for everyone. We are way more powerful than them. And they know it, and I know it, and we know it. So if we all do our, and people say they're overwhelmed. They're like, the world is such a bad place. What do I do? Do you. Do you. Because when you step into your power, when we all do that, it's game over for these people. So that's my two cents. Thank you so much for that. That's so empowering. I'm like, man, I want to go kick some ass right now. <laughs> Doug, go ahead. It's your turn. <laughs> okay. Well, I had a couple of points. Um, one was I struggled healing because as I healed, it meant I had to acknowledge what I'd been through. And because what I'd been through was so horrific, that made it difficult to heal because, you know, the more I healed, the more I had to acknowledge how bad it was and then I heal some more and how, and so there was these layers of grief associated with the healing that in some ways was holding me back a bit till I could understand what was going on um, because you know I was fearing the grief I was you know for, to admit to myself what I'd been through totally was too much because it was overwhelming and so I had to do it quite slowly um, and the other thing is when we're programmed, a lot of the alters um, in our personality system that are fractured are made to look like demons or made to look like our perpetrators. Like a number of my uh, parts were modeled on my parents because they're my main perpetrators. So that way I had to get to a point where I had to have enough conversation going internally with those parts, because normally what we do is we'll have child parts who are then controlled by um, trauma parts or, or perpetrator parts who are then also controlled by higher parts who threaten the perpetrators. And that tends to keep everyone in line. So the child part is kept in the child state. As you heal and you grow out of that child state, part of that process is going to the uh, perpetrator parts and dealing with them, not in a horrible way. And this is where we've got to be careful sometimes with um, exorcisms and stuff like that, because a lot of damage can be done. You've got to identify whether someone is actually got a demon possessing them. And like Rachel, my father would uh, double in size when he'd become possessed. You could see, you know, a total transformation of him that wasn't very nice. But if you try and exercise a part of your personality system, for example, that can create more damage. So how I deal with perpetrator parts is to love them. So you've got to go to those parts of yourself and deeply love them and understand why they're doing what they're doing. Often they're not doing what they're doing because they want to. It's because they were traumatized into doing that and they're still too scared not to do that. So um, what I would do is get my child parts to sit there when I'd got to a point which was this was possible and I'd get the perpetrator parts that were dressed like my mother and father already I would have sat down with them and talked everything through with them normally we don't like being dis disassociated it's not a fun thing because we're all fragmented in all these isolated bits and pieces and that's not a, a joy of living that's a very separate way and so I would find the commonality with my parts would be, do you enjoy being a perpetrator? Typically, the answer would be no. And so then with that part, I'd say, okay, well, if we give you a not new job description, what can we do? And so I'd start the conversation, start building the trust with those parts of me. At the same time, I'm working with the parts above them saying, look, you know, we don't want you to keep threatening this part. And it becomes this inner dialogue. But progressively with love and loving your own parts and giving them new job descriptions and allowing to, them to do the things that they want, but also becoming inclusive and bringing them into all the other parts so that they're part of a, 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 a loving family um, instead of a you know, disruptive family becomes quite good. And this is something when I go to work, I'll say to my internal system, I'll say, right, I've got to work. The, we'll get the front person to work but while we're working can you guys at the back keep 
continuing this loving process and keep working with each other and, and sharing and things like that. And for me, that's really powerful because one, that stops me having negative thoughts because, you know, the negative thoughts might come through one of these persecutor parts. As Max also said, um, we have um, programming to self-harm once we speak. And that's another part of us that's programmed to do that. So then I have to go to that part and work with that. And, and this does take time. You know, for all of us, we like to sleep a lot. We need to rest a lot because it takes time to live after what we've been through, what we've been through. So I have, have that sort of gives some more in-depth understanding of the internal system. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doug. That was a great description. And Rachel, what do you have to add to this? Well, in relation to healing, um, I just wanted to say that I had some memories throughout my whole life. I didn't get to, to squash those, but um, my body remembered the really horrific memories uh, and started to bring them through before the actual uh, intense, you know, ritualistic memories and, and the really horrific stuff came up. And it's interesting because that came up hand in hand with the psychic abilities re-emerging. And for a while I had to, big part of my healing was actually coming to the understanding that I came into this lifetime on a soul level, knowing my parents, knowing that it was going to be difficult for a purpose. Because during the time that my body was in agony and I, you know, at times I couldn't, I, I struggled to walk at one point. I wanted everybody to know what I'd been through and my body showed it. I was just this tragic victim. As soon as I recognized that I came in on a soul level as a powerful soul coming in to have this experience because there was some purpose to it, the pain started to go away. Um, so I'm not saying that it's not okay to be in pain. And I'm not saying that everybody has to, you know, decide that they came into their life to experience the things that they did so that they could have a higher purpose. But if you can get out of that victim mode, that's where the resilience comes in. It's so incredibly powerful. It wasn't that I just immediately forgave my father who was my perpetrator, my main perpetrator, it was that I got to the realisation that for whatever reason, he played a part and I played a part and I'm doing now the work that I think is really, really important. That's why I came in here in the first place. And part of that is the psychic work because, again, my psychic abilities came back in as part of the memory process because a lot of the abuse involved psychic ability, you know, communing with these demons for, for these sick cowardly adults who couldn't do it themselves so as far as the gifts go you know you don't have to lose them like max said you don't have to give them up just because you're going through a healing process I've, I've had some survivors say similar things to me about you know you've got to give that up because that's part of a program i was always innately psychic it was just that it was abused um i don't use any of the abilities um in an in an evil or wrong or unethical way the way that i was taught to use them now, as an adult, I completely switch that around. That's really powerful, being able to switch that around and help humanity. It's, yeah, that, that's that's massive part of the healing. I love that. And it's important, you know, going back to just taking our power back. And yes, like, I think that's a big part too, why people in this community are so against it, because all that they hear for the most part are the ways that it was exploited in these stories, right? When this wasn't something that somebody just, you know, implanted in you whenever you were eight, this was something you guys were born with. So whether or not you would have went through trauma, obviously that can, you know, you were trained over and over and over again to use these abilities. So it was something that became a skill, but regardless, you had them, whether or not they put you through MK ultra or satanic ritual abuse. So again, you would have had these anyways to use in a fashion that you would have given consent to. It's just, you were forced to do what other people wanted, like Rachel said. And I think that's really important to delineate between that for people. Did either uh, Doug, Max, did you guys have anything to add after listening to anybody? Yeah, I'll, um, my psychic abilities, I see a part of who I am. It's not part of the cult. And, you know, I think it was we discussed before, they will target a lot of children to hope to get at least some who have got the abilities and if you don't have the abilities normally you're killed so because if you can't disassociate then you're too much of a risk for them so <laughs> excuse me um but none of my abilities diminished i find them very helpful now um because there are there's 
what keeps me strong, if I can put it that way, against my um, abusers. You know, often I'll know when they're going to try something or they know when they're going to do something. You know, I, I can hold them to account a lot better if I can put it that way. But it's something that was, I don't I know that was, well, maybe it was amplified because I think when we go through what we go through, it's like training for anything. Um, you get better and better and better at it. And they would push us again and again and again to see what our limits were and whether we would survive. Most of the testing done on us was to push us to absolute limits. Like when electro electrocution, for example, you'd get buzzed again and again and again and again and again. For me, it was till I couldn't stop throwing up. I think I wrecked their experiment, but it was just, if I didn't have, or if the three of us didn't have the resilience we have, we wouldn't be here today. Um, so yeah, we're using it for good. We're not gonna do their dirty deeds. And I agree, it's it's abilities that they identify what we might be good at and then work on that. But see, you can turn that around. You know, I was raised in many different countries. I grew up trilingual. Um, I can, uh, I, I've always had healing abilities. I became, you know, a psychologist because of that. But guess what? I'm using those abilities against the global cult. You know, I have helped many, many people recover from trauma. And, you know, I use my voice now on, on my show, Unbroken. So, you know, you can take those gifts, reclaim them, and use them for good. Amen. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Reclaim them. Use them for good, everybody. <laughs> I wanted to open it up now to talk about the central heterochromia. That was a, I know that that's a big topic. Figured this part could be more of a group discussion if anybody wanted to sort of start. I know all of you have, have talked about this before to some capacity or heard each other talk about it. Um, but I'd love to open up the floor for this discussion. It, it's very fascinating how a physical feature that a certain percentage of the population has could indicate, you know, something like a psychic ability. And I'd love for you guys to maybe talk about sort of the history of that, like why that is. What is central heterochromy in a sense and uh, how, you know, it pertains to your stories? I think, Doug, given that was your race, <laughs> it, maybe you should <laughs> start, that one. start, Doug. Okay. Um, well, I started research. How many years ago is it, Rachel? Wasn't that long, two or three years ago? Yeah, I reckon it must have been a couple of years at least. Yeah, so when my eyes started changing colour and things like that and I started looking into it, and I'm still researching, I'm finding it's still, there's areas that are inconclusive, but what we're noticing, and I had dinner with a, another survivor, um, it was about a week ago, she has central heterochromia as well. Uh -huh. So, you know, so it, it seems to be, general populations, 1% or 1%, um, is how rare it is. So it's one of the rarest eye conditions. It can be because of trauma, but that seems to be very little. Um, it does have a high prevalence in the Scottish ancestry, um, but then it has a very high prevalence with celebrities and with survivors of ritual abuse. So the avenue that interests me is because we're dissociative, is this being expressed in our eyes? Are we getting two different colours or multiple colours in our eyes because that's an expression of disassociation? I've also had a lot of people who are psychic, their eyes change colour when they do their psychic work, which is really interesting. So I don't know if that happens with you, Rach, but... Um, Not you that know, I'm that... aware of. Okay. Um, and I know my eye colours do change um, quite rapidly. Or well, when I say rapidly, they can be more green one day, more blue, more hazel sort of things. And I've noticed in my family, you know, um, you know, my daughter has blue eyes, same with my brother, and they can either be brilliant blue or they can go grey blue or, they, you know, all those sorts of things. So I do notice with people around me, eye colour does change. When we've looked into the research, Hitler was fascinated with it. Um, you know, and trying to change people's eyes colour. So I was talking to the other day and they said they had, they were injected as a child to change their eye colour as well. So there's this fascination about it. And so, you know, it's just continual research to try and understand what's really, really going on. Another thing that I read was that people with heterochromia have two sets of DNA, one in the blood and one in the flesh. I still haven't been able to confirm that. So it's just, 
where you know it, it's something that's come up it's something that's very um yeah prevalent amongst us and it's something we're still coming to terms with yeah so that one there you can see is blue on the outside and you got more of the gold in the inside um but it's yeah it's, that's a fascinating topic what do you think Rach? Yeah, um, th this is one of the things that just absolutely fascinated me when, when Doug started asking me about it. So I've got five different colours in my iris. Um, the Hindus believed that people who had central or full heterochromia, so central is where you've got the circle of, of different colour around the pupil to the rest of the iris. Full heterochromia is when you've got two different coloured eyes. So one's green, one's blue, one's brown, one's blue, that sort of thing. You've got segmented heterochromia as well, where just one partial. So you can actually see an example of that in, in that, that top row, top uh, third to the to the left has got a segmented part of the, um, the iris is a different colour. Yep, well done. Um, and, um, there's, and there's one in the middle just below it too. And there's... Um, I think, I think they call it partial as well, where you've got maybe even a whole third of the iris is a different colour to the rest of the iris, so it's like a pie shape. So the Hindus believed, and this is also, again, Doug's studies, um, that people with these eye conditions had uh, were able to commune with God. They could see the future. They had these psychic abilities. They um, could in, um, connect with otherworldly entities. So I think that it's that plain. It's as plain as the eyes on our face these people who study psychic ability can see going around, they might go to childcare centres and, you know, this is what drives me crazy about, you know, the governments in particularly in Australia. So they don't necessarily have close up photographs of children's faces, but we've got something in, in South Australia where I, where I am, where they've, they've got cameras, like they're, they're photographing the children throughout the day and uploading that to the computers and sending that out to all of the family members who can then just share that QR code to anybody. They could put it on the dark web if they're a sick member of, you know, of that family. Um, and then that children's information's out there. So if it's a close enough photograph, they'll see the central heterochromia. They'll know where that child goes to school, when they're at school on that day. They'll know exactly where they're at school, which class they're in, whether or not they're, they're smart, not so smart, easy to target. Um, it, it just drives me crazy. So, you know, there's these databases being produced of people. And so, again, you know, this is a fascinating topic, but please don't share photographs of your iris around on the internet because it's an identifier. And if you've seen the movie Minority Report, again, you know, that's a projection that they're doing. They want to be able to do iris scans of people. And this is why, because then they've got this database and they can see who's got these abilities and who hasn't or who has the potential for them. And I don't think that just people with central heterochromia or full heterochromia have these abilities, but I think that this is one very clear and easy um, uh, site sort of, you can see it, it's that clear. So it's almost like running around with a barcode on your forehead. <laughs> Look at me, I can do things, you know? And then they know that if they dissociate that person enough, yeah, uh, it, it does seem really quite fascinating, Doug, what you also pr produced about the, the connection between RH negative blood and the central heterochromia. There does seem to be a connection there. And again, these these satanic bloodlines have that RH negative blood. So, it, and it's fascinating that it's it's a, um, a Celtic thing. Because obviously, you know, Doug and I, we're actually cousins. We didn't realise that until Doug's research again discovered that, you know, I, I shared the, the family history with him and he managed to find a correlation because my, my maiden name is also McIntyre. So, you know, and we've both got it. The number of people in my family who have it is astounding. And again, you know, Doug's rare because it's a one third of that 1% of 1% I think you shared with me is male. The majority of people with central heterochromia are female. Yeah. Yes, that, that's fascinating. What do you think, Max? You know, you, Doug, uh, turned me on to the whole thing. I didn't even know that existed. And so you had me going and looking at my own eyes. <laughs> and my eyes are blue, but they change color. They go from a baby blue to a navy blue, sometimes a bit of a green or purple. So all my life, people have commented, your eyes change color. Like, what's up with that? I never thought much of it. And when I looked closely, um, around the the iris there's it's a golden it looks like a sun like there's little um i don't know it's like a uh uh, uh like a sun when you draw it with a little rays that come out so there that's there so i guess i have it i 
I hadn't, you know, I don't know much about it, but I do know that the eyes are the windows to the soul. So when we're in physical form, we're going to reflect uh, our soul lineage. So the, the Satanists are very bloodlines, but I think what's more important is our soul family and our soul. Like that is obviously what, what does everyone say that the eyes are the windows to the soul? So I think this heterochromia might be revealing the soul lin lineage of people who come here and who are possibly a threat to the global cult. Wow. This topic is, it's so fascinating because even, you know, I went back and you know, even on my Substack article, I put like a bunch of celebrities that had it. And I was like, that's so interesting because I, I recall looking at specific people and being like, what is it about their eyes that it's, they're so pretty? You know, they're almost like, they draw you in and you don't realize it's because they have multiple colors necessarily. For some reason, they just, they sort of are attractive in a way, you know, or kind of stand out or look different or um, just have this uh, like brilliance to them almost, you know? And it wasn't until, you know, Rachel brought it to my attention and, you know, Doug chimed in and was sharing some of his research that I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many in Hollywood. You just put it in Google and lists and lists and lists. I mean, you'll find lists of like 50 celebrities that have heterochromia of some kind, 60 celebrities, 25 celebrities. There's just all these different articles written about it. And so many of them do. And I, and then again, going from the survivor perspective that I got an overflowing amount of people who were like, oh my gosh, me too. Oh my gosh, me too. I have that. Or my mom has it, you know? And it is really fascinating. And I think it does beg the question, you know, if there's just this very small percentage of people that have it, and we know a lot of, and I would almost beg to say all celebrities that make it sort of big time are also products of these systems. So, you know, we can divide survivors in Hollywood, but I mean, when it comes down to it, I think there's a lot of similarities in the childhood of what happened to everybody. And so asking, you know, what do, what does this demographic have in common? is it trauma? You know, is it dissociation? Is it going through things that the normal person wouldn't and it somehow impacts our eyes? I mean, it impacts your body in a lot of ways that are, you know, uh, probably supernatural in a way and, and things that you guys have experienced, whether it's, you know, the, the physical body pains of getting memories that the other people may have never experienced in their life. You know, there's so many ways that our bodies ab react to trauma you know, and in our eyes, I think are something that that begs the question of does this have something to do with it? Did either of you two, Rachel or, or Doug, have anything else to add? Yeah, yeah. The other thing that's very interesting in relation to trauma, and I lo listen to a lot of podcasts on uh, near death experiences because um, it's just an area of fascination and life experience. <laughs> And they say, when we die, we either go to the light, to the dark, or a combination of the light and dark. And so people who have those experiences, it normally amplifies their IQ. So it can double or triple your IQ. So that's another thing that they're starting to do research on is when people have, when they die, they go to the other side and come back. There's normally a significant, not always, but I think the if I got my... Um, tax right 60 to 80 percent i can dig up the research and send it through if you want but it has a massive impact on people's iq and it can amplify it incredibly um so you know we have uh that impact yeah we you know we, we just become very good at survival i think staying alive you know <laughs> because it's, it's something that we're we're trained in well we're not trained to stay alive but that survival instinct in it's because it's tested so often as a child. And the other thing is when you go through trauma as a child, it can take you at least two decades to deal with it. Whereas when you go through trauma as an adult, it's normally about five to seven years. So I think we're starting to understand trauma a lot more. I was listening to uh, Gabo Mate recently, and he said um, people who are very, very kind and can't say no, usually as a result of trauma, end up with autoimmune disorders because the psyche won't say no because they've been trained not to, but the body does because the body says, no, we've got to create a boundary. And that boundary will often be a sickness. 
So it's a fascinating area. I think as we delve into it, we could learn a lot from it. Yeah, um, also, I think, um, just trying to think of the guy's name, um, Doug also pointed out to me that um, these celebrities that have central heterochromia or full heterochromia are often in these Marvel movies, which is yeah. describing and, and expounding on the fact that human, humans have these incredible abilities, but they're latent. So um, the guy who keeps playing Superman, can't think of his surname, Kale or something, he's got segmented heterochromia and, you know, Robert Downey Jr. has done many of the of the um, different Marvel characters. Um, I mean, you look into, uh, you know, Scarlett Johansson played a, 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 an individual called Lucy in, in one movie as well, but that was about drugs, but it's also about this enhanced ability, enhanced intelligence, yeah, just um, off the scales. Yeah. Yeah, so pre-programming, pre what are they setting us up for? You know, they tell us everything in advance. You know, I watched Aquaman the other night at IMAX because we're in Sydney, and it was interesting. Any time they became possessed with the spirit, they got heterochromia. Ha. Huh. Yeah, it's it's full on. Yeah, there you go. There's Mila Kunis. She's got it. Kate Bosworth. Yeah, it's unbelievable how many of them have it. So and and it, also, it, sort of, it kind of explains, sorry, a lot of these people, I'm not saying it, but I'm not being libelous about any of the, for these particular actors or actresses, but some of them really don't have any great gift. And you think, how did this person get into this position? And it's nepotism, it's cronyism, and it's, there he is, I couldn't think of his name before, Henry Cavill, um, he played Superman. You know, how? How is this possible? It's not about ability with a lot of these people. There's also the factor that having this condition means that they are dissociative, as Doug has pointed out. What do you need for somebody who's going to play a role, pretend to be something that they're not, and do it convincingly? You need them to be dissociative. So yeah. and why how is... many of these people are actually bringing a demonic entity into their body that's then playing a role? I mean, we, talk, we, we see so much about people like Beyonce. I don't even know if she's got central heterochromia, but that's an example of someone who allows in this entity that she describes openly as Sasha Fierce. That's not her. She can't do it without Sasha. If you know, if that's not demonic possession, I don't know what is. Sorry, Doug. No, no, that's all right. I was just going to pick up on a point you were saying, Rach. You know, I mean, <clears throat> we worship actors, you know, as though they're the celebrities, the leaders of the world, they're the storytellers, they're playing make believe, and yet we have a culture now that worships them. You know, why aren't we, you know, um, what about all the people who are doing brilliant things in the world, saving lives and things like that? Why are they just discarded? Where a group of people, you know, we watch awards every year for these uber wealthy people who are just really, you know, some of them are good at role playing. You know, it's, it's sort of, yeah, doesn't they're make liars. sense. I know, yeah. I know that sounds really rude and rough, but but they're lying. <laughs> they're, they're convincing liars because they're playing a role. And I'm yeah. not, I'm not having a go at acting and acting actressing it's just why are we revering people who are pretending to be something that they are not and that that is the that is the example perfect example of the psychopath they are pretending always to be something that they are not to convince all of us that they're okay when they absolutely sure. are not it's social engineering that's what hollywood is for and and all other varieties of it it's it we like Doug said earlier, the brain cannot distinguish between an actual thing in front of you or, or what's playing on a screen or even what's in your own imagination. The nervous system reacts. So apart from all the subliminal stuff and the frequency involved in TV programming, and they call it programming, you know, so they're telling you, it's showing a certain lifestyle. Like in every show I've ever watched, people drink copious amounts of alcohol. They throw back shots. I mean, you'd be dead if you threw back half the shots that some of these actors do. You know, it's like, you're watching that going, no, that's not even possible. But so they're trying to normalize and glorify alcohol because alcohol rips holes in your aura, entities can come through, and you're very, and again, you're, you're dumbed down, you're more, more easily manipulated. They will show certain, like, you know, that that is a true statistic. There's I don't know, by the time a child is 18, how many murders and rapes and, and dismemberment they have seen on television. Even something innocuous like Grey's Anatomy, which everyone loves to watch, I was I watch TV and I analyze it, you know? It's like they're showing an open body, they're showing blood and guts, 
that's satanic, right? They're trying to, nor and on sitcoms over the decades from the 40s to today, the age that children date or are interested in dating has gone less and less and less. So you have like 10 year olds being all sassy and wearing crop tops and, you know, talking about the book. In real life, they're trying to groom children towards pedophilia, you know, so et cetera. I mean, I could talk an hour about the different social engineering, but that's what that's for. We watch it and we are herd animals. We take a child and any those of us who have children, what do children do? They copy everything. They copy what you do all the time. That's how they learn, they mimic. So they put stuff on the screen and they know that it's good. we're gonna absorb it and we're gonna mimic it. All the fads that happen, they're on, they're on TV or on media of some kind. The incidence, for example, of children who identified as transgender was extremely yeah. low until that's pumped out, pumped out, pumped out. And now the number has increased exponentially. It's not natural. So the social, so that's what it's for, exactly what it's for. It's to engineer us into whatever thing they want us to go into. Yeah. Great answers, you guys. I hope that gives people a few things to ponder about, you know, things that we're used to seeing all the time and, and maybe don't ever question. Um, we have about, I would say about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll start wrapping up and you guys can tell people where to contact you. But I wanted to sort of open it up and talk about a couple other topics that I think are really interesting that I got requests from to talk about, which was ley lines and auras. So sort of the energetic side of what you guys can see and experience that other people can't. And maybe if, if you guys want to talk a little bit about what those things are. I know auras too can tell you almost about like the health and vitality, somebody's mood, you know, even uh, things that people can do to improve their aura, you know? So I'd love to open it up uh, and have you guys talk about a couple of these things. The The ley lines are obviously a geographical energy type thing. Um, Rachel knows a lot more about that than I do. I'm probably getting the lingo all wrong, but wanted to just open it up to you guys to talk about these couple of things just because they do come up and I think it's like a natural fascination that people have. Yeah, I don't know if everybody minds if I start. Yeah, so um, I've been fascinated with ley lines for about the last 10 years purely because I was, um, I'm an avid photographer and I'd go out and take hundreds if not thousands of photographs in one day and then take them home and take lots of, you know, check them out and, and see if I could see anything interesting in there. And by interesting, I'd say, you know, it's not just the birds and animals that I was photographing in the trees and, you know, the beautiful nature that I was picking up on flowers and things. I would also find in the photographs that there would be these pareidolic images. So pareidolia is, according to psychology, and not to denigrate psychology, I, you know, obviously there's beautiful people in psychology like Max, but there's also those that would just take all the magic out of the world and relegate everything to some sort of, you know, scientific, you know, non-magical um, factor, but a non-spiritual factor. But Pareidoli, pareidolia is where supposedly the mind correlates things that have no real correlation to being like humans. So you might see a face in a, in a tree or you might see a face in a rock or in your linoleum there might be faces or knots in a, in a, um, in a cupboard of a walnut, you know, veneer cupboard might have little knots in it that look like faces or animals or whatever. So when I'd be taking the photographs, I'd be looking for those sorts of things as well because I see those things out in nature quite a bit. Sometimes I'll see them while I'm taking the photograph and sometimes I won't see them until I get home and look at the photographs. During the process of taking all of these photographs, I would notice that there would be these perfect circles in nature in some of these photos. Sometimes I wouldn't notice it unless I was away from the computer, the, the picture was up on the screen and I would notice there'd be this perfect circle somehow in nature, which is rare, within the photographs. And then I recognised that these tended to, to turn up in specific areas. So I'd go out there and take a whole series of photographs in the area and came to the conclusion that I was actually photographing ley lines. When, because ley lines are a specific frequency, the frequency bends light so that even if there's no tree behind or plants behind um, the, or within the ley line space, which belies it, um, because trees and plants try to avoid to grow in them. So you might see a tree and it might have a, a, a limb that's all bent around in a perfect circle. And you think, how on earth does that happen? Or, or arcs around in a perfect way. And then you might notice that the plants behind it are doing the same thing. And then you notice a corridor. 
And if you allow yourself to go into relaxed vision, where you're not looking clearly, but you're allowing your eyes to go out of focus, you can see it much more clearly. Walter Kilner, who's the father of Curly and Photography, has stated that when you use relaxed vision, you can pick up different aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum that you cannot pick up with focused vision. And he's the father of Curly and Photography, which is the photograph, pho photography of the aura. So again, you can you can get a leaf, uh, cut half of it off, take a Curly and Photography photograph of that leaf, and the part of the leaf that has been cut off will appear as the aura. It's still there even though that part of the leaf has been removed. So it's evidence of the aura, evidence of the soul, or the energy of that particular living thing, even when it's not there. So what I found with these ley lines is that plants and trees avoid growing within them. If they do grow within them, they become very misshapen. They become they, they try to avoid this perfectly um, cylindrical tunnel through nature. It's most obvious in na natural areas because you can see it. Also, within those spaces, which I finally worked out, were fifth dimensional energies. So the, it's the representation of the fifth dimension within the third dimensional plane. And within the fifth dimensional plane, these tunnels, you get doorways to other dimensions as well. So higher and lower dimensions. So these are the corridors that souls go through to get to the dimensions that they belong in, that they, their soul frequency allows them the key to the doorway of when we pass over. And when we come in as well, this is our entrance and exit to the third dimension to be on earth. So what I'm teaching now is how for people can, can identify them, go out to them. And what I'm trying to teach people is basically the Satanists have been using these ley lines and where they cross over, they create portal spaces, large vortexes and portals. That's where a lot of these things like, um, you know, the Vatican, which Max speaks about, you know, she's, she's been involved in rituals there. Um, they, 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 they basically, the Satanists will do horrific things in those spaces to try and program those energy lines, which I believe are the Earth's soul to a certain degree. It's what keeps the, the Earth alive. Without this, we would have a barren planet. They do that to program the energy on Earth for misery, death, torture, murder. They're trying to, they basically, you know, when you look at names like um, BlackRock, that's an intention. That's an intention that they're trying to create. So it, it's extremely important, this information. People need to know where to find these. Otherwise, you have to learn how to douse, and that's, you know, complicated. You can actually go out into nature, find these beautiful lays, go and meditate within them, use energy, energetic protection before you go in because you can get attachments because, again, there's dark dimensions that are that are, are, are allow entities in through these spaces as well as light dimensions that are, um, are connected to them. And... and I'm I'm trying to convince people to go out and sing into the into the lays or, and into the portal spaces, um, taking positive frequencies. Play a guitar, but play in major chords. Don't play in minor chords because minor chords are depressing. Um, and just to lift the um, with intent to lift the earth's frequency to bring her into a higher, happier frequency and to undo the damage that's been done for so long. Oh, you're muted, sweetheart. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. I've seen you post about ley lines a little bit, uh, but I don't, I'm very new to that too. So that is very fascinating. Sort of the soul of the earth. That's a beautiful way to put that. And does anybody want to talk about uh, auras a little bit and explain maybe what those are and, and how, I guess, how do you see them and what do they, what do they do and what do they mean? I think Rachel should take that one too, but I just want to say a thing about the ley lines. You know, these these people that part of the global cult, they, you know, in terms of their hierarchy and the pyramid, right below the tippy top, which are not human, are the coven. So they know black magic. They know astrology. They use these energetic lines on the planet and they've craftily built the Vatican on a certain one, you know, Stonehenge, Washington, D.C. is is structured similarly to the to the Vatican with the circles and, you know, and the monument. So that's a whole nother layer of their control that's kind of abstract because most people don't know anything about it, but they have absolutely utilized these energetic lines and for the dark but they can be utilized for the light. And 
to my knowledge, um, Earth has been kind of a nexus planet. Like there have been portals to the higher dimensions and portals to the lower astral dimensions. And so with the rituals they do, they want to open the portals for the lower astral dimensions, you know, the hellish beings to come in and be part of this reality. And there have been portals that are fully light. And so with those, they've tried to shut them down. So to my understanding, there's been some light ones. You might say they're like a portal to the heavenly realms in the Middle East, which is why there's always war in the Middle East. They're always bombing that area. So it's just, I don't know much of, as much as Rachel, but what I do know is that they are utilizing these energetic sources um, for evil. So it's it's important to know about it. And Rachel has spoken about it several times. She spoke, she had a brilliant presentation at my summit about that. So you know, I, I would highly recommend people find Rachel and listen to that presentation or or take one of her classes because I think it's worth learning that. And in terms of auras, I've learned the little bit I know from Rachel, so I'm just going to defer to her here. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Um, I forgot to mention too, there's a, an incredible um, book called The Old the Long Straight Road or The Old Straight Road by a guy called Alfred Watkins. And in the very beginning of that, the pagans, the Romans in the UK, used to dedicate their ritual, ritual spaces to the spirit of the forest. And I mentioned before these paradolic images that I would see in these photographs. Um, when I was photographing the ley lines, I would find, um, well, before I even realised I was photographing ley lines, I would see that there were these faces in nature, in the trees, in the plants, humanoid faces. I recognise now, because of the readings that I've done um, and the information that's come through, and Watkins has this dedication um, information in his book, these entities are fairy entities. They're fifth dimensional entities. They are the custodians of the lays. They want us to know that they are there so that we can use them for light because they don't want the earth to die. They don't want the Satanists to have this energy take over and, and to control the lays for these bad things. So that's something that I show in my course, some of these entities that I've actually photographed in these spaces i mean it's incredible um and with regards to auras i know doug has a lot of information on auras too because he sees them as well um everybody has a soul the soul that doesn't well basically your soul is your aura and it operates the body like a puppet through the soul um chakras and the meridians and so again the ley lines are the, are the meridians and the portal spaces the chakras are her her, her chakra spaces um so the soul frequency that we have has a hue and a resonance and a vibration. Different hues indicate certain vocational abilities. So if you have a white aura, then you're most likely a healer. You usually can become an Akashic adept. You can pick up information without even having to think about it. It just comes through the pineal gland as long as the pineal is healthy. Um, if you're a blue sort of throat chakra colored soul, if that's a lot of the soul colors relate to the chakras of um, influence. So someone with a, a throat chakra colored soul would be someone who's an orator, a vocalist, often an academic. Um, someone whose resonance is um, orange would be very sexually driven, very money driven, very selfish. Um, red auric presentation can be very fine. It's very difficult to pick up, but that'd be your psychopaths. So, you know, it goes in different levels above the crown. So if you've got a violet aura, you're usually a psychic. You pick up on a lot of things, you're precognitive. So each, each aura frequency denotes certain characteristics or personality traits, vocational abilities. So that's something else to take into consideration. Just to go back to the chakras of the earth as well. So, so I believe the Vatican is a chakra spot that they, they're manipulating. There's also Uluru in, in Australia, which is in the centre of Australia, that is supposed to be the sacral chakra of Australia. It just happens to be a big, bright orange rock, reddish orange rock. Um, and it's a sacred site for the um, original people here. That is a crossing of two dragon lines. Dragon lines are the biggest of the ley lines in uh, around the world. There's not very many of them. Three appeared, there were three pairs up until 2012. And then another one appeared in 2017, one appeared in 2018, and one appeared in 2019 while we're going through this incredible awakening period. So that is highly significant. So the lays are becoming more powerful and, and growing in exponentially um, at the same time that humanity is getting to a higher level. And also I wanted to point out too, um, in a, 
uh, a gentleman called Rory Duff did a book um, on energy vortexes and ley lines, and I thoroughly suggest people read that one as well as Alfred Watkins. And he's, he talks about that there's scarcely a one kilometre, um, um, square kilometre of, of earth that doesn't have a ley line in it. You know, they are everywhere. They are literally everywhere. He has a table where he shows all the different different varieties from dragon lines down to the very, very fine, smaller ones. He paces them out. He's a dowser, so he even shows you how big they are as far as the energy frequency, how far they radiate out. Um, but the ones that I see are typically, the ones I see mostly in photograph are most, mostly are about two metres across, so they're reasonably small. Um, with, with Uluru too, um, there's a, a famous case in my country which allegedly involves uh, Marina Abramovic who is the um, spirit cooker. A lot of people would know about her because it's, she does some pretty strange stuff. It's supposed to be performance art. It's really horrific and scary. And again, it's a kind of programming to see blood and, and you know, what appears to be human sacrifices and eating humans and just trying to make it normalised. Um, she's allegedly involved with a sacrifice of a child, a baby, at Uluru. She went missing. Um her mother was convicted for it, then exonerated because it was just ridiculous. She didn't do it. Um, and that child's name was Azaria. Azaria means protected by God. So that whole process in that chakra space was to flip the bird at God. <laughs> you know, that's what these people do. They, they find this amusing. It's entertaining for them. It doesn't matter who they take, who they abuse. I also heard that Azaria, Azaria also means sacrifice. So I don't know if that's actually correct. But I did look it up and see that it means um, protected by God. So, yeah, I mean, that's alleged. Uh, um, I was going to see, I want, uh, Max, if you needed to go right now, um, totally up to you. If you want to stay on for just a couple of minutes, I wanted to give Doug a minute maybe to just to talk about auras, but I wanted to check in with you. If you have to go, I'd love for you to be able to share where people can find you and all of that. Um, that way you can get to your appointment if you need to. Um, so just want to check in with you. I have about five more minutes, so it's okay. You know, yeah. Okay, Doug, do you want to do you want to spend a couple minutes and just talk about um, auras quick, and then we'll wrap up? Okay. Um, well, the thing that just comes to mind for me is energy. So, you know, with me with auras and ley lines and everything, what I do is I when I cross. Um, town lines you know where the line between one town and another town i sit there and i see if i can feel the energy shift and so i think that's a good thing for people to do is to see if you can feel energy shift when you move from one jurisdiction to another and in the same way then you start to it's just exploring with energy because we're all made of energy everything that's solid is really just space and energy but i think if we start to tune into energy um it makes these things a lot easier because then you can start to feel the ley lines. And also it's like with chakras, it's learning. And I think um, Rachel's the class I've done with hers, you know, you sort of blur your eyes, you, you soften your focus and that way you can start to see the silhouette that forms around people on that soft focus. It's like if you stare at something and look away, that's still imprinted on your eyes. I don't know if other people get that. I get that a lot. But um, but it, it, it's just learning to tap into what's around us. We have all these instincts. You know, uh, animals know when earthquakes are going to come. You know, we should as well. But we become so much more complacent because we live in a society of convenience that we keep losing all these skills that at one stage used to be very, very valuable to us. Great insight. It is really fascinating. Again, just exploring the things that that we've forgotten that we can do, you know, and yeah. I really appreciate all of you coming on and helping remind us who we are, helping bring us back to how we can use these things for good and that people should be scared of what the evil is doing with these gifts, but that we shouldn't look at them as negative in people that are using them for good and people that were born with these gifts that they've cultivated. So I appreciate you guys normalizing this conversation and, and talking about this with me. And I'd love to go around for you guys to share where people can find you, keep up with you, connect with you. Um, and I'll start with Max. Um, and then we'll, and then we'll wrap up for today. Thanks, Emma. 
Um, people can find my website at unbroken.global. Um, I do interview truth warriors, SRA survivors, uh, Doug and Rachel are on there, um, and teachers and healers. Um, I recently did a summit and uh, both Rachel and Doug spoke there and other amazing people. That uh, The recordings for that are on sale on the website for a, a reduced fee. Um, you can become a member uh, on my website and we have uh, Zooms twice a month. Um, the first one's coming up on January 10th. And uh, some of the people that have spoken at the summit and others will be attending those Zooms. So if you wanna, I wanna create a global community, you know, where we can talk and sort of, you know, brainstorm how to both heal ourselves. And we need to create something new as the dark structures are falling. They're, they're dying. The beast is dying. And that's why it's lashing out like crazy. So when one thing comes down, something else needs to be there to take its place. So let's bring our all our brilliance together and brainstorm what we can do to change all the different structures in the world. So that's where you can find me at unbroken.global. And thank you so much for having me here today. Absolutely, Max. Doug, where can people find you? Are you online? No, they can't find me at the moment. I'm a I'm, I'm, I'm not online. <laughs> no, I, I used to be. I've, I've got to get the presence up and running. So that's something for this year. As I said, uh, Max has said, I'm on her channel and also on Rachel. So I am endeavouring to get up there. Hopefully this will be a big year. I've got some books planned. Um, I've got some um, helping out with some courses and also to do some... Um, um, you know, discussion groups on how to research your past and things like that. So there's a, quite a few things I've got that I want to do this year to help survivors. So, yeah, I will get a point of contact up there. I had to pull back for a while because of death threats and things like that. So that's where I needed a break from that, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'll get back on there. Wonderful. And thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Such an honor to have you on. And we'll we'll definitely plug your links whenever you get there. We'll we'll bring you back on and you can promote all of it and we'll get everybody to follow you there. What about okay. you? Where can people connect with you? Well, um on BitChute, Rumble, Telegram, and YouTube with just my name. And I also have a website, www number six six science.com. Thank you, Emma. Again. Welcome. It's an honor to have all of you here. I appreciate you guys so much. And for people listening, I'm going to have all of their links below. Please go connect. You know, this is information that's never going to be featured on the news. And if we want people to wake up from what they've been asleep to, it's really up to us. You know, we are the ones that have to take initiative and share this information, learn it, you know, and sort of defy the old system and build a new one, just like what Max was saying. You know, we need to create the world that we know we can a, a better world than what we have a better world for our children you know and and all of these amazing individuals have incredible resources for you hours and hours and hours of their time that they've donated for free and things that you can pay for to learn additional if you want extra exclusive time with them to learn specific things so i'm going to have all of their links below i'll have all my social media links below you guys thank you so much for watching god bless you all and we will see you next time